Good evening. I wanted to thank people for coming out tonight, but I do wish to acknowledge uh, that we're meeting tonight on the ancestral, traditional, and uh, unceded Indigenous territories of the um, Coast Salish people. I was on the um, uh, BC Yukon Kairos Rolling Justice bus last summer. Uh, we traveled from Vancouver to Fort St. John, and we were visiting activists and First Nation communities along the way. And what we were doing was we were asking a question about what are faith communities to do post Truth and Reconciliation Commission? What's, what are, what, what's up for us and where are we going? The, um, just up on the screen, there's some logos there that you'll see. And the logos are of uh, different organizations that have um, signed on to a, a letter from Amnesty International to Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, asking that um, the environmental certificates be removed from the site C Dam to stop it. And as I see those logos going by, I guess what we were hoping to do is let you know about how many people are actually supporting the cessation of activities up at Site C, but also so you might think about organizations whose names you don't see there and people that you might talk to about joining this uh, important movement. And I want to acknowledge our partners tonight, um, of course, First Metropolitan United Church, where we are, Sierra Club at British Columbia, Raven Trust, and uh, Kairos, Canada. And now I'd just like to take the opportunity to introduce um, the speakers tonight, and come on up, folks. Uh, Julian Napoleon is going to speak first. He's from the Dane Zak and Cree, from the Sotu First Nation in northeastern British Columbia. Napoleon grew up immersed in the subsistence practices of his family and community, hunting, fishing, foraging, and learning cultural protocols. Currently nearing the end of a biology degree in food and environment at the University of British Columbia, Napoleon also works at UBC Farm, raising pasture, uh, laying hens, and annual vegetable crops. Thanks, Julian. He'll join us in just a second. Um, so so they're, they're militarized. Um, they're deploying these divide-and-conquer tactics. And why would anyone have to do this if they were doing the right thing? Is this what, what companies do? Is this what Crown corporations do um, when they can have faith that they're doing the right thing for society. Next will be Ben Parfit. Ben's here. And Ben worked as an investigative journalist with numerous magazines and previous to that as a reporter with the Vancouver Sun. He's a freelance writer and researcher and you may have seen his work. Where, uh, he works in league with the um, BC Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And Ben's an author and co-author of several books on forestry issues and currently devotes a lot of time to energy and resource issues. Why this dam at this point in time? Because according to BC Hydro's own estimations, it is not until 2028 that we would even need one iota more hydroelectric power in this province. Next up, um, Anna Simeon. Come on around, you guys are hiding behind me. Uh, Anna's been on staff at Sierra Club BC for the past 10 years. She has a background in journalism, communications, and community organizing. She worked for six years with the UN International Tribunal for War Crimes as a legal translator and reviser. And Anna is now Sierra Club's campaigner for the Peace River. Thanks, Anna. As Julian pointed out, a militarized BC Hydro presence with an aggressive pursuit of the schedule with complete contempt of the court challenges that are happening, nothing matters. We'll build now and worry about damages later. That's what Christy Clark thinks. She told people at the Bill Bennett's funeral that she will get this beyond the point of no return. That means I don't care what the courts say. I don't care what the right or the wrong is. I want this dam. And then uh, our last speaker is Susan Smitten, who's the executive director of the Raven Legal Defense Fund. She has an extensive career in journalism, filmmaking, and writing plus event planning and public relations. Susan applied those skills in a film um, about uh, Tets and Binny Fish Lake, uh, saving that from the um, Tetsuko mine uh, people. Uh, as also, um, Anna was involved in that campaign too. RAVEN is an acronym for Respecting Aboriginal Values and Environmental Needs. And we're based here in Victoria, but we are the only nonprofit charitable organization in Canada that raises legal defense funds for First Nations who enforce their rights and title to protect their traditional territories. And as a result, Raven is working to support 
the West Moberly and Prophet River First Nations in this David versus Goliath legal run up against BC and BC Hydro, and both of which I'd like to point out have unlimited legal funds and a veritable army of lawyers that are working tooth and nail to defeat the First Nations. So let's, um, thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to turn things over to Julian, and then we'll, we'll be back in a little bit. Julian. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you for having me come out here today. Um, and again, just to acknowledge the Coast Salish people whose territory we're on this evening. Thanks for allowing us to be here. Uh, so, just, uh, I'm a pretty big guy. There we go. Um, a little bit about me, uh, you kind of mentioned, um, I'm from the Soto First Nation in northeastern BC, which is in Treaty 8 territory. Uh, we're one of the communities that stands to be directly impacted by the Site C Dam. So uh, I grew up <coughs> out there, um, leading a pretty traditional lifestyle with my family, living off the land, uh, hunting, fishing, gathering different wild foods, and uh, being taught the values of my people, the Danesa people, uh, of treating the land with the utmost respect uh, and honor and protecting it because it supports and provides us with all that we need to survive and thrive. And uh, I guess this project is a, it's very personal for me and uh, for a lot of the people up in the Peace region, not only the First Nations people, but also um, everyone all the farmers in the Peace River Valley. It's a, it's a big deal for a lot of people and a very, very personal issue. Uh, you know, you think of the Peace region and it's, it's, I mean, that's what it is. It's the Peace River region. It's defined by that river. And uh, our traditional territory as the Danesa people are bounded. It's bounded by that watershed. So every waterway in the entirety of our territory flows into that river, the Peace River. Um, and uh, a lot of you probably know there's already two massive hydroelectric projects on that watershed, uh, the W.A.C. Bennett Dam and the Peace Arch Dam, which uh, created, well, the first dam created the Williston Reservoir, which is just a massive, massive reservoir. Uh, the second dam created Dinosaur Lake. And uh, what happened with those, those previous reservoirs um, the inner bark layer of the trees, it's called the cambrium layer. Um, and when that's disturbed, uh, it releases methylmercury into the water and it bioaccumulates in the ecosystem. So now the fish in those reservoirs are no longer safe for us to consume. Um, the, the oldest reservoir, uh, the Williston Lake, the levels are so dangerously high in there that you can't really eat any of the fish at all. In Dinosaur Lake, uh, the levels are slightly lower, but you can only eat maybe one serving a week, a pretty small amount. In the Peace River currently, there is <clears throat> some mercury content in the fish, um, but it's substantially lower than in, in the reservoirs, and uh, we do eat it still. Um, the fishing there is exceptional. I've been fishing in the Peace River my whole life with my family. Um, but the reality of this new reservoir for us as at the Soto First Nation and also a neighboring reserve, the West Moberly First Nation, um, we're on Moberly Lake. Um, the outflow of that is the Moberly River and that flows into the Peace River just uh, about 100 meters upstream of the proposed dam site. So um, it will directly impact the Moberly watershed that our reserves are, are located on. And Right now, um, a lot of elders in our communities, they depend on a subsistence net fishery for their well-being in the springtime. Um, it's a time of scarcity of a lot of wild foods and uh, people have been practicing the net fishery on that lake for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, no one's really talking about, uh, about the potential implications that will hit right at home for us. And, and, and like I said, the majority of the people that depend on this are the elderly people in our community. So. It really puts them at risk, and uh, it's, that alone for me um, is such a big issue. So, 
just wanted to mention that. Um, the other thing is, is uh, moose. As Deniza people, our culture is so intimately intertwined with the moose. They provide the vast majority of all the protein that we consume, and uh, our entire livelihood and well-being is uh, kind of, it's, <clears throat> it just goes hand in hand with our relationship with the moose. They really are who we are, are a big part of who we are. And the islands located throughout the Peace River in the flood zone are uh, extremely well used moose calving grounds. The cow moose um, swim to those islands to calve in the spring because they have uh, safety from predators and from disturbance. And, and again, uh, for us, uh, with the importance we place and the respect we hold for the moose, um, to, to flood the calving grounds on those islands is just unthinkable. Um, and then looking at the future, if this area is to get flooded, 10,000 10, hectares, um, the ground there is very, very unstable. Um, like when you walk around, you can notice it's just this loose till that gives way underfoot. And uh, Hydra has said that because of the instability of the ground, um, so just to put it into a time frame here, the closest flood time would be seven years from now. And uh, they're saying that due to the instability of the surrounding ground, uh, no one will be able to access that area for an additional 30 years while it resettles. Uh, so for me as a young man looking at moving home to my traditional territory once I graduate from university, uh, I'm looking at being in my, in my 70s when I'm able to uh, go to that waterway again right in the heart of my territory. So thinking about that, it really, uh, it's just unthinkable. I can't imagine it. It's been such a big part of my life um, and such a big part of everyone's life up there. So yeah, the implications are, are huge for us. Um, when you look at our oral history as an indigenous people, the Deniza people, um, all of the stories that we have are all based in that valley. So um, we definitely had a territory uh, that extended beyond that valley, but that valley is the epicenter of, uh, of our oral history. Um, so it's a very, very significant place. It's a very sacred place. We have numerous grave sites and countless sites of historical significance. Uh, many of you might have heard of the Rocky Mountain Fort site uh, where the Treaty 8 Defenders of the Land had been set up with a culture camp in hopes that they might, well, they did successfully postpone uh, the clearing of that land for upwards of 60 days. But that site um, was not only the location of the Rocky Mountain Fort, which is a, a very historically significant fort that marked the first point of contact between early fur traders and indigenous people in the region. But archeological evidence from that site has shown upwards of 8,000 years of continuous use by the Danaiza people as a, as a camp where we would um, render moose, elk, and buffalo tallow to make pemmican that we survived on over the winter months. So uh, in terms of a historic site for us, it really goes back to time immemorial. And there's countless sites like that all along that waterway in the flood zone. So uh, I guess, you know, it it's, might seem melodramatic, but, but I do feel like, like uh, uh, our culture and identity as people are so intimately tied to that valley. And um, not that we won't persist in the face of losing it, but we will lose a big part of who we are forever if we lose that valley. Um, so that's kind of a, a perspective from myself as a Deneza person, but uh, what, I, what I do as my job right now, I'm a farmer, and in school I study sustainable food systems and food security. And when you look at the Peace River Valley from a food security perspective, you cannot measure its value in dollars. The area can, um, I'm sure many of you heard the number, but, but uh, Wendy Holm, who also works at UBC, uh, determined that it could feed a million people in perpetuity. And uh, when you look at, I don't know, I've met some people here tonight that have been to the, to the piece. The valley is it's incredibly beautiful. And on one side, it's 
excellent farmland. Um, and on the other side, it's what we call the Peace Morbidly Tract, and it's not good farmland, but it's excellent hunting and uh, trapping area that is like very close to our reserves, and it's an area of special interest for us. So there's kind of this natural um, lay of the land there that lends it to accommodate farm use as well as our uh, cultural use of the, of the land on the opposite side and on the opposite shore. So yeah, but just looking at the suitable farmland, that area could feed a million people um, in addition to continuing to support our traditional land use activities. So it's so, uh, it's so valuable. When you look at the droughts that have been happening, um, California, I'm sure you've all experienced uh, increases in your vegetable prices with the drought that is happening there, but also right in the lower mainland, you know, uh, the Fraser Valley is our largest agricultural area in the province, and uh, the reservoirs in the North Shore Mountains in the Fraser Valley have an extremely limited water holding capacity, so when we don't get fall rains, all of a sudden, um, we run out of water very fast. I know you experience similar things here in, in the uh, island too. I hear about the Cowichan River having record low flows. So it, it's uh, a serious concern and global warming isn't exactly getting better right now. So when you think about um, the long-term food security implications, uh, it just, it only increases the absolute need to, to save that valley because it does um, sit on a very large aquifer of, um, of clean, clean water um, and it, it just uh, it could produce a lot of food. It's crazy because you go all the way up north, you know, it's pretty far up there and you think what could even grow up here? Um, but my friends Ken and Arlene Boone, they've been leasing out the lower piece of their land there to some local farmers and I dropped by last summer and uh, they're growing cantaloupes and watermelons there. And I don't know how much you know about farming, but you can't even grow those here on the island. You can't even really grow them uh, in Vancouver. Um, you can grow them, but they don't taste nice and sweet. And these melons that they're growing because that, that extremely hot microclimate they get in the Peace region are sweet and delicious and incredible. And I was just blown away. It's, uh, it's class one farmland, which... which um, it's not just based on the on the quality of the soil, but it's based on the climate and the hydro uh, the hydrology of the of the system. So, it really is the highest quality you can get, um, and it's it's just crazy. Like for me, coming out of school, like if I could do whatever I wanted, I would probably just farm in the Peace Valley the rest of my life <laughs> because it's that good of farmland. It's it's incredible. Um, yeah, on the south-facing slopes there, you even get, like, cactuses, which I, I, it's hard to put into context, but it's really far north, so it's just, it's crazy. Um, yeah, so there's that, another component of it, uh, the food security issue, because going forward into the future, that's what's really important for all of us, um, is going to be food and water. Uh, you know, it's only going to become... Uh, more and more uh, important as we go forward. And when you look at energy, um, BC Hydro currently, their current public statement is that there's no demonstrable need for the power. Um, so that alone is such a, 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 just an astounding statement to be going forward uh, uh, in the face of common sense um, for a project that has no demonstrable need. Uh, and the reality of this project the $9 billion price tag um, that us as the taxpayers will be footing for years and years to come. Uh, a gentleman in the crowd mentioned to me earlier, well, there's that, there's that, initial, uh, that initial cost, but what about the interest on the debt? <laughs> and very well imagine the interest on a $9 billion debt going forward for years. So the, the economics of it are pretty crazy. Um, right now, hydro, and the provincial government are scrambling, trying to figure out what they could even do with the power. Some of you might have seen in the media, they were trying to broker a deal to sell it uh, to Alberta. Alberta's not really interested in, in buying the power. 
Um, and so the reality that we're looking at um, is, I'm just gonna look at a note here, but having to sell it on the world market is a very, is a very likely scenario in the short term um, until we do maybe develop a need for that power in the future. Um, and that would mean, of course, if we're gonna develop that need, that need it would mean that we're not um, pursuing any sort of more sustainable alternative energy, which that's where the future is. You know, we're all intelligent people, we're all capable people, and we should be leading the world uh, innovating sustainable energy. So uh, there's a fellow, Robert McCullough, who's an economist out of the States, and, uh, you know, looking at having to sell the, the uh, energy on the world market. The reality of that is that delaying the project would actually save us money. And I was just blown away. Uh, he states here that, that if we could delay this project for five years, it would save us $1.2 billion. So <laughs> to go forward with it, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no way that you could justify this project. There's no way that you could explain why it's worth doing. There's no angle. Like, if someone could give me one reason that you couldn't defend with common sense, then please do, because I haven't heard a single reason why yet, and I'm waiting to hear that. I, I don't know if any of you have, but uh, I'd be interested to hear that argument if there is one. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we were talking earlier um, uh, about the removal from the agricultural land reserve. The agric agricultural land reserve was put in place to protect our, our valuable farmland into the future from development projects. And uh, they had the largest single withdrawal from the agricultural land reserve uh, since its inception to kind of green light this project a while back. Uh, and that was uh, 9,180 acres that they removed and that kind of flew under the radar. Like, I feel like I'm pretty entrenched in the agricultural community and the food security community and a lot of defenders of the ALR. And uh, it's crazy how, how few people heard about this because there wasn't really any public process or announcements regarding it. It's the way they're operating it. Uh, they just kind of made that happen. And uh, so, yeah, their tactics around this project, I feel like are kind of a, a, a dead giveaway um, that they know how foolish it is because they're operating in a very non-transparent uh, way. Uh, we were up there last summer um, and they announced that within 24 hours, they gave us a 24 hour notice to all the reserves in Treaty 8 uh, that they were gonna be cutting down the trees that had eagle's nests in them in the valley, the eagle nesting trees. Um, of course, the closest possible flood date at that time was seven years in the future, and by all means, the eagles would be returning the next year, having to rebuild their nests. So we were trying to, kind of scratching our heads, like, why would they give us 24 hours notice that they're going to come in and cut down all the eagles' nests in the whole valley? And the, the only thing we could reason is perhaps they were trying to gauge the response they would get from people, trying to test the waters, see if there's any activists uh, that are going to do anything. So uh, we couldn't really figure it out. Um, that was our only, only logical reasoning. Um, but what we did in response to that is we organized a community gathering on our friend Esther's uh, property overlooking the dam site. Um, we had community members, predominantly children and elders, gather to join in prayer and song uh, overlooking the site where they were initiating uh, the removal of the eagle's nest right at the landing where they're making way for the dam. There was a small group of us, maybe 40 people, um, joined there on that private property. And, and as we joined hands in prayer, um, a large truck drove up on the hydro landing below us and started videotaping us. Five minutes later, uh, a jet boat that looked pretty military, military, military style jet boat came up and started whipping around in the water below us and then they anchored and again they started videotaping us from the boat. 10 minutes later they had a helicopter over top of us. Um, so that the way that they're operating up there, it's kind of scary. Like I would say that they're quite militarized. 
At that same time, they had placed a guard with a machine gun in front of the BC Hydro office in Fort St. John. I didn't know that's the way that Canadian Crown Corporations behave, um, especially when you're dealing with a group of predominantly elderly and children, uh, local residents that are just trying to um, say goodbye to the eagle's nest. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's something they've been doing. The other thing they've been doing is they've been deploying these kind of community division tactics that you hear about or think of uh, taking place more in the global south and you don't merely think happen here but it's very well happening here and um, so this peaceful camp that was set up by community members um, they were on the front line of the clearing that BC Hydro is doing um, at the dam landing and what they did uh, was they looked for indigenous community members from our local reserves that had been living off reserve for a long time and working in the oil and gas industry. And they recruited those people and hired them on as the security on the front line to stand against their own community members who were there um, in, the, in the camp. So that's, that's another one of the tactics. So, so they're, they're militarized. Um, they're deploying these divide and conquer tactics. And why would anyone have to do this if they were doing the right thing? Is this what, what companies do? Is this what crown corporations do um, when they can have faith that they're doing the right thing for society? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> it seems like, a, like they're giving themselves away when they do stuff like that. Um, a lot of you are probably aware that this project was made exempt uh, from the review of the BC Utilities Commission, which is the regulatory board that's put in place to review energy projects to make sure that they make sense for us as citizens of British Columbia, economically and socially. This project had been previously rejected by the BC Utilities Commission because it doesn't make any sense at all. And now it's going forward uh, with an exemption because I could guarantee you that if it went through that review process today, it would be rejected again. So there's, there's many factors at play here. It's a very multifaceted issue, and there's so, so much at stake. Um, not only uh, our treaty rights, um, not only our culture and identity as Danisa people, not only the food security uh, of Western Canada, the long-term food security, um, not only the relationship between government and Indigenous people trying to forge a way forward um, in a united nation into the future, um, but also who we are as a country and the way that we do things, our dignity. Um, so, yeah, that's just where I want to leave things in terms of my presentation this evening. I don't really have too much more than that to say, but I just want to really thank all of you for, for coming out here this evening. I don't know where you all stand in this matter, but the fact that you're here um, and you want to learn more um, is a really encouraging sign to me, and I'm, I'm really touched to see all of you out here tonight. It's really encouraging, so thank you all so much for coming out. We're going to invite uh, Celeste to come up and, and give a welcome. Hi, it's got I'm My Indian name is Celeste. I'm a member of the Cowards and Tribes, which is Duncan. First of all, to explain the Coast Salish territory it starts from Comox all the way down the east side of the island, down the states. We have many relatives down there. There was no border then. That's still our tribal group. They belong to us of the Coast Salish Seas. So I want to welcome a brother here from on the mainland to the Coast Salish 
tribal groups at the Coast Salish Seas. You're welcome. We've been, uh, we've been fighting the same kind of thing that you people are fighting on the island here, and I know what you're going through. Number one, the Shonagan Lake dump site where they're dumping toxic material. It'll drain into the Shonagan Lake and poison all the people around. Number two, we're fighting to stop the clear-cut forest of the last remaining old-growth forest. You know, this government, this premier, has got no respect for anybody. She's bought out by the, corp the corporations, Site C Down, Shawnigan Lake dump site, old growth forest. So we're all fighting the same battle, really. And it's got to stop. I'm worried right now because Trudeau is down in the States meeting with uh, Obama. And I know Obama's going to try and persuade Trudeau to accept the TPP and the C-51. If Trudeau really supports it, what he agreed when it first came out, it's going to wipe everything all out, all we've been fighting for and still trying to fight for. They'll come in here and take over. Ever since the Europeans came to this country, all they have ever done, they lied, they cheat, and they steal. This, this province, we were the richest, one of the richest countries in the world, the resources we had. Other provinces too. But they let corporations come in and they sell all our resources out. If, if this government would have kept on to their resources and processed our own resources, we'd all been well off. But you take a look. All foreign investments taken over. What, what have we left? The crumbs. So I know what you're going through because we're all fighting the same kind of battle, different places. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Shawnigan, big protest. The whole Shawnigan village turned out to try and stop those people from poisoning the water. Two, three weeks ago, Lilo Island people were down here at a meeting talking about what they were doing up there. Same thing. So again, we stand together and try and fight all the, the corruption. So I want to thank you for being here, and I hope you take that message to the, your people. We're all fighting the same battle. We've been doing that for, since the 1400s. So how's it going, Thank you so much, Celeste. Now I'm going to welcome uh, Ben Parfit. Well, uh, first off, I just want to say uh, uh, I'm so grateful to see so many people out uh, tonight uh, uh, in the face of such inclement weather. It's, uh, it's really great to see you all here. Um, and uh, secondly, I just, I just wanted to give a sin sincere thanks to Julian for uh, giving us such a, a heartfelt uh, and detailed presentation. Uh, it's really great that we have someone here tonight that can speak to the values of 
the land because he's been on that land and seen what is there and what is at stake. Um, I think for many uh, people uh, that are dealing with this issue, um, it, it is a, it's a rather hard thing to deal with because it is a land that is a, a long ways away. And for many people that live in British Columbia, the, the vast majority of us, um, no, north is a place called Whistler, right? It's, it's not a place that most of us ever really consider. Uh, we live in a very, very large province, and most people uh, living in Victoria and Vancouver don't travel very far north of the cities uh, that they live in. So consequently, we don't really appreciate uh, what is at stake. So uh, again, having Julian here to talk to us about that, I think is really, really important. Um, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about one narrow, but I think very important aspect of the Site C story. Um, and it, it, it kind of is a jumping off point for, for uh, some of the comments that Julian made around you know, why this project, it doesn't seem to make any sense. And uh, as somebody who has, has looked at a couple of aspects of this project, I myself am very confused as well. So I want to just start off by, by giving a pe people that may not have been up to the region just a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, so this first picture here is a picture, uh, it's a rather incongruous image. This is actually a picture of the Williston Reservoir, which is one of the largest uh, uh, artificial lakes uh, in North America. It's one of the largest water bodies. Uh, it is the largest freshwater body in British Columbia. And the Williston Reservoir was created over half a century ago by the building of the W.A.C. Bennett Dam, named after uh, W.A.C. Bennett, uh, former premier. And it is a dam that is massive in size. It was one of the largest earth-filled dams in the world when it was built uh, back in the day and it has impounded a huge amount of water. And most of us probably don't think much about uh, where the light comes from when we uh, routinely turn on our, our lights in our homes, but about a quarter of all of the light and electricity that all of us in this room and others in the province benefit from has its origins uh, in the Peace River region and the building of this first dam and this dam, which is a short distance downstream of the W.A.C. Bennett Dam. This is the Peace Canyon Dam. Um, uh, you may notice on the uh, 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 stage here a couple of pictures, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. So this is uh, the Peace River uh, about 80 kilometers downstream. Uh, from the Peace Canyon Dam, and this is the site of where uh, the proposed Site C Dam uh, would be located. And this uh, roughly is what that same site looks like today. Now, because this place is so far away, out of sight, out of mind, it has been very easy up to this point in time for Premier Clark to do what she has promised she is going to do, which is to take this project, in her words, past the point of no return. That's what she wants to do. And I think when she says that she wants to bring it past the point of no return, she's probably thinking about getting it to that point by about a year from this May. And that would be when the next provincial election is. Um, but that is her stated goal, which is to take the project past the point of no return. At the same time uh, that the construction activity uh, that has resulted in all of this land clearing has been taking place, something else has been taking place that nobody's talking about. And that is the building of new hydroelectric transmission lines in proximity to where the Site C dam would be. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight why this dam at this point in time? Because according to BC Hydro's own estimations, it is not until 2028 that we would even need one iota more hydroelectric power in this province. The only reason that it would possibly be needed is if there was new industrial usage for that power. 
And that is what this transmission line here is all about. It's called the Dawson uh, Creek Chetwind Area Transmission Line, or DCAT. And you and I, and everyone else in this province, is now on the hook for that project to the tune of $310 million. And nobody is talking about that project. That project is being built for one use and one use only. And about four weeks ago, BC Hydro issued a press release in which Premier Christy Clark was quoted, Energy Minister Bill Bennett was quoted, and Jessica McDonald, the CEO of Hydro, was quoted. And they were all singing the praises of the building of this line, which again, you and I are paying $310 million for and counting, because it was going to deliver, quote, clean hydroelectric power to Shell. So we're going to be providing power from a new $300 plus million dollar transmission line to Shell and other natural gas companies operating in proximity to this dam so that they can use hydroelectric power instead of the natural gas that they are burning at their uh, uh, generators and, and other uh, facilities to move natural gas through pipelines. That is what is behind the building of this line. And the only reason that you and I know anything about the building of this transmission line was because this particular project was subject to review by the BC Utilities Commission, which is our independent electric utilities uh, overseer, and the BCUC actually looked at this project, and because they looked at it, we know how much has been spent to date on it. Now, this picture here uh, gives, uh, gives you a, uh, an understanding about something else that is happening. I said that we've spent $310 million to date on this project. The project isn't finished. So all of the wooden uh, tra uh, transmission line poles, which are the old hydro lines, are going to have to come down, and you and I, again, are going to be paying for that. This is not the only transmission line project that is in the works, that is being supported by our provincial government and by BC Hydro. There are two other transmission lines that we know of. One would be built by a private consortium. Another one would be built uh, with public funds. And both of those projects our energy minister has decided should not be subject to review by the BC Utilities Commission. So in other words, we're not going to know anything about the costs associated with putting those two other lines in. Now when I was up in the Peace River region last November, I traveled by car about 140 kilometers north of Fort St. John to where one of these new lines will terminate. That line is going to terminate in an area called Pink Mountain, which is the primary operating area of a natural gas company called Progress Energy, which is owned by a company called Petronas, which wants to build a liquefied natural gas terminal at Lilu Island and export gas from the fields in the Peace River region overseas to Asian buyers. That line may cost us $500 million. But we're not going to know because our provincial government has said that that project and one other new transmission line project will be exempt from review. What we do know is that both of those projects are going to be built to supply quote unquote clean hydroelectricity to the natural gas industry so that the natural gas industry can use massive amounts of water to pump underground to release natural gas from below ground and one day perhaps pipe it to Prince Rupert for export. So I think that this is a pretty ironic development that we're not really talking much about. This is a uh, uh, natural gas uh, well and a holding pond for massive amounts of water about 20 kilometers away from where the Site C dam would be. This region of the province is riddled with well pads like this. Millions and millions of gallons of fresh water are being pumped underground and poisoned 
and withdrawn from the hydrological cycle forever to produce clean natural gas. So if we want to ask why this project is going ahead, one of the significant reasons why Site C is being contemplated is to provide hydroelectric power to the fossil fuel industry so that the fossil fuel industry will be marginally less worse from a greenhouse gas uh, emissions perspective than it currently is. And bear in mind that even though it will be cleaner than it is, at the end of the day, all of the natural gas that these companies save by not burning it in their field operations simply gets put into pipelines and sold at profit by these companies and it gets burned somewhere else and the environment is not going to care one iota where the emissions come from. We're still going to have greenhouse gas emissions associated with all of this. So I want to very quickly say this is what the vision is for our gas. Deliver it to the natural gas sector, perhaps one day see it liquefied and sent overseas. The effects of all of this is that our hydro rates are being driven up dramatically. This is a pulp and paper mill in Quinell. The pulp and paper mill in Quinell in this picture in 10 years is going to see its annual hydro bill jump by $16 million a year. That's what's coming down the pipe in terms of hydro rate increases in this province. It potentially is going to cripple an industry employing hundreds of people. Uh, and it's going to cripple the poor among us who already are having a hard time paying our hydro bills. So keep that in mind. Lastly, if we think that hydroelectric power is safe and sustainable, bear in mind Lake Mead. This is a shot of the Lake Mead Reservoir. The water level is 37 meters below where it was 15 years ago. Julian spoke about food security. The U.S. Southwest is in the worst drought we've ever seen, and California is a major supplier of our water. This is happening right now down in the States. The hydroelectric capacity at the Hoover Dam is down 25% over what it was when the dam went in because there's not enough water. Lastly, uh, Julian referred to the economist uh, Robert McCullough, whose testimony was provided to the BC Supreme Court recently in the injunction hearing uh, that BC Hydro applied for to get rid of the protesters at Rocky Mountain Fort. Just want to leave you with the message that installed wind power comes in at roughly half the cost of what Site C would. And that's not even having a conversation about what we could be doing with solar and what we could be doing with major thermal installations in the province. So if we want to know why this project is being built, our government's vision and BC Hydro's vision is it's largely about giving our, turning our water over uh, to hydroelectric power and providing that hydroelectric power to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, lots to think about. Thanks, Ben. Anna, come on up. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, this has been a holy, almost holy people-powered campaign. Big foundations have been reluctant to fund it. Why we are able to be here is because of people like you who have been holding down the southern portion of the peace fight. First Nations and the farmers up in the peace have been holding the north, and people like you have been at the forefront of keeping this issue alive for the past, since 2010, when the dam project started being promoted again. Uh, so thank you. And the, the honorable exceptions among the foundations are the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, which has funded us, and the Patagonia. So I wish to start by thanking them as well. Uh, this is uh, not the piece. Uh, what you're seeing here is a river in practically in our backyard across the strait uh, down in the United States, it's the Elwa River. And just a few weeks ago, the Seattle Times told the dramatic story of how this river came back to life. The hum of the generators was replaced by the river singing in full voice, shrugging off a century of confinement like it never happened. Nature's resurgence is visible everywhere. That's because 
uh, in the past two years, the Washington State ha and, the Corps of, uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers have taken down two dams on the Elwa, one at the very estuary at Port Angeles and one up in the watershed. Within weeks, uh, salmon and trout were back, moose, elk, eagles, the whole ecosystem began to regenerate. Uh, why they took it down was partly because the tribes were clamoring for it, but mostly because them, they're the United States, the first dam builders in the world at this scale are finding that dams don't pay, and they don't pay their way, and they have to be maintained. Beyond 70, 80 years, they are not cost effective. So for every kilowatt that Site C is purported to provide us, the United States to date has taken down a whole dam. So this Elwa story is a real Hollywood tearjerker. Um, you can't help cheering. Uh, it was portrayed in the Damnation movie and there is a video of it, of the creatures coming back and you can't help but tearing up when you watch the video and um, even though you know people paid for it twice, first it, for it to be built and then for it to be taken down, you cheer and you think, okay, the good people won and Mother Earth has given us a second chance. Well, if we lose this, if this go in, goes in, we will not get a second chance with the peace. This will be lost forever. And this sorry, is 60 meters high earthen construction, losing 100 kilometers of river valley bottom. And for each kilometer we flood, we are paying $100 million at the BC Hydro count. We are sacrificing this, or BC Hydro wants us to sacrifice this, uh, which is an absolute food oasis in the middle of the boreal forest. And it's been really hard. Um, it's quite counterintuitive when you know that the boreal forest, that it actually grows this kind of food that yeah, that's the valley from floor to ceiling. So when you see at the bottom where the, where the farms and market gardens are, it's about two degrees more than up on the top. And even up on the top, which is the level where Fort St. John is, in the summer, it's about 40 degrees. And because the valley goes east to west and is one of the very few valleys that we have in the Rockies that goes that direction, it has the sun from... In June, from about 3.30 in the morning until about 11 at night. So the long, long, long daylight, um, it's a convergence of many blessings. It's something absolutely unique that doesn't exist anywhere else. The convergence of the long, long daylight, the alluvial soil that took thousands of years to build, and the microclimate makes this land relatively restricted in size, able to produce fruits and vegetables to meet the nutritional requirements of one million people. That's one quarter of the BC population. One quarter of the BC population. And Richard Bullock, the former chair of the Agricultural Land Reserve, calls this a sin against humanity, and I think he's being polite. It's criminal activity. Knowing what we know about climate change. So Julian spoke a little bit about the impacts on the culture of the, of, of the First Nations and the peace, the Soto, the Halfway River, the West Moberly, the Prophet River. There is a number of nations who par participate in the Treaty 8 tribal group. And that's, that picture was taken with permission at the Paddle for the Peace the year before last, last year we had about 1,000 people attending this event in July that has been going on for about 10 years uh, for the protection of the peace. And they welcomed us settlers and showed their cultural wealth, which is all connected to the land. So what they stand to lose is, qu what we stand to lose is heartbreaking. What they stand to lose is quite in unmeasurable by any measure. Next one. in terms of several hundred sacred spiritual sites, grave sites where the ancestors were buried, um, near 
uh, the site where the site C would go is an old cave uh, near Charlie Lake, which has been investigated by researchers from UBC and found to contain remains and artifacts from 10,000 years ago. That's how long uh, Treaty 8 nations were present in unbroken succession and how they know it was 10,000 years ago because it has a kind of caribou that has since gone extinct. So the two kinds of caribou coexist in these archaeological layers. And other, there is other archaeological sites that, that that particular one would not be flooded. There is others that would be flooded. Um, so words fail you um, at such destruction. Uh, this is Chief Roland in front of the legislature. Chief Roland, the West Moverly First Nation, show, showcasing one of the contaminated bull trouts from the Wacky Bennett, as Julian uh, mentioned. So bull trout is the northern version of our salmon. That's the staple that sustains the people. And he is in his right hand, he's also holding a Hershey's Kiss. That's how much a healthy adult is allowed to consume of this bull trout contaminated by the Wacky Bennett. So the Wacky Bennett contaminated the upper piece because bull trout migrate and it bioaccumulates in the tissues. So the upper piece is no longer able to be fished. Um, now, if Site C goes in, the other half of the Peace Watershed will be practically close to native fishing. Next one. And here you see Chief Roland also in front of those, one of those calving islands that uh, Julian mentioned. So when we were there, we went out in the boat last summer with one of the um, local uh, people there. And we actually saw, we didn't see moose, but we saw elk calves and deer calves. And all those, you see how friable those, uh, those um, sedi how, how sedimented this rock is. So that's what the banks are made of. So that's why the flood zone is actually has to be doubled in terms of loss of acreage because of the sloughing into the water of these river banks. All those, all those rocks are pockmarked with hundreds and thousands even of cliff swallow nests. It's beautiful. Next one. And so this is the other half of the Indian and Cowboy uh, Alliance, as Chief Roland says, that's Ken and Arlene Boone, the third generation farmers who are farming this land, uh, right there on Bear Flats, right next to the river. And they have been really heart, soul, pocketbook, and body uh, in this fight, uh, most recently at the Rocky Mountain Fort. They really came there. This is the uh, construction as viewed last November from what's, call, what's called the protester sh shack that was built. So before the uh, Rocky Mountain Fort was established, the encampment, the um, Treaty 8 had a little shack on this northern side of the river where they would um, have people taking pictures and monitoring all the infractions that were happening by BC Hydro. So that's the view of the construction there. Now you'll see the shack. That's Elder George Desjardins viewing the construction. Next, please. So I think this gives you a little bit of a sense, a visual sense of that land that's so far from us. Um, and even for, uh, for us here, like every day I go on Facebook and look at the news and it's hard for me to look at these pictures. It's really devastating for, for them up there it's it's a daily it's a daily struggle with the grief and somebody called it recently uh, a psychological war on these communities and that's exactly what it is uh, because none of this is uh, the eagle nest destruction wasn't necessary as as Ben pointed out in terms of the engineering schedule there will n nothing irreversible will happen for another seven years but they won't you to believe it is. They want you to believe it, it's a done deal. So we have to keep strong and keep heart. Next one. And so the big question is how we are going to win. Next one. 
yeah, that, sorry, that's an, just another picture of the Rocky Mountain Fort. I forgot to say, so that's a historic site both for First Nations and for um, settlers, uh, because that's the site where the first mainland fur trading post was. And it's very different from any, anywhere else. Uh, those fur trading posts were usually well protected. Uh, obviously, settlers arriving in large numbers were a destabilizing presence in terms of there were friendly tribes and hostile tribes. They were defended with stockades, sometimes two or three layers of stockades. This one didn't have a stockade because the relationships at that time uh, between the arriving people, and it wasn't a, a gold rush. Um, there was a little bit of a gold rush, but mostly people came there uh, across the land from Eastern Canada because they wanted to settle and they wanted to farm. And so that's the spirit that has been prevailing up to now. So actually, Christy Clark is reversing, not reconciling, she is reversing what was actually a way better relationship 200 years ago. So how are we going to win? So Susan here from Raven will be t talking more about the legal path. And the legal path, there is two. So we are going to win with, on the left and on the right. And one path is long term, and that's the legal cases. Um, the other path, the federal government path, is the one we need to be strong on right now. Because the federal government has the power to stop or halt or pose this project. Right now, um, things are really polarized um, and very hot. On the one hand, the opposition, just in the last few months since August, September, has gained so much ground with the unions coming out, BCGU, um, QP, Local 21, with the NDP and Greens in the legislature saying no to Site C and John Horgan making it a part of the platform, with all the mayors and councillors in this province saying, no, you can't build this, you, it has to go through the regulatory pathway. Social justice groups, First Nations obviously were already there. Um, in the past, only in the past weeks I had emails about this initiative and that initiative not connected to what the main groups and nations were doing, but just people in their communities kind of waking up to this dam and saying, we have to do something. So that's the sign we have turned the tide. We are finally, we have been fighting this ideology of big dams. It's, it's been really hard, really hard not, not to crack in BC because we all have been brought up for two, three generations now on this heritage dam stuff. And so we kind of have the mindset that we believe it's a, good, it's a good thing. So it has been hard to get to the point where people are saying, okay, at the really grassroots level, and that's happening now, and we have to capitalize on that. But at the same time as this is going on, with all this opposition gaining momentum, BC Hydro and Christy Clark are getting really aggressive with as Julian pointed out, a militarized BC Hydro presence with an aggressive pursuit of the schedule with complete contempt of the court challenges that are happening. Nothing matters. We'll build now and worry about damages later. That's what Christy Clark thinks. She told people at the Bill Bennett's funeral that she will get this beyond the point of no return. That means I don't care what the courts say. I don't care what the right or the wrong is. I want this dam. Her story about why the dam is necessary has changed almost weekly, <laughs> or it feels some, like that sometimes. It was about providing power to households. Then we realized, well, no, there is no need for power for households because our households are actually using less power. We are good at saving power here. Then it was going to be sold to California. Well, it doesn't meet the standards for clean energy. Then it was going to go to LNG. Guess what? Um, we hit some roadblocks there, eh? So now, after first putting down the Alberta government in the throne speech, she wants Rachel Notley to buy the power. It's not going well. So obviously, it is an irrational and ideological commitment. 
that is not going to listen to reason or feeling or anything, um, any British Columbian has to say, uh, and it's got to, it's got to stop. Uh, because this dam is going to build, uh, to dig a rift between settlers and First Nations that we will be trying to repair three generations down the line. Is it time? Yeah. Thanks. And she's implicating all of us in another violation of treaty rights. So uh, even as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission tries to build bridges back, even as each of us tries to reconcile with our neighbors, she is miring us in that guilt and that has to stop and that's why the federal government is the best avenue and we need to really pressure them to stop it uh, because that's their, that was their, what they campaigned on, that's what a lot of us worked to achieve to get them into that office and they have got to deliver. The honeymoon is over. Um, they have to start delivering. So how are we going to do this? Um, obviously, the First Nations pressure will continue. Um, and meeting with key ministers and so on is ongoing. Um, there is the international scrutiny and pressure that's happening, especially with UNESCO coming in May and June to investigate the impacts uh, of the Site C Dam on uh, the Wood Buffalo National Park, which is an na international world heritage site. So they will be right here, not in BC, on the BC side, but in Alberta, investigating on the ground, and they will be listening to us. That's an opportunity to shame this government if they don't, don't stop it. Um, right here on Saturday, we have, the, we have the opportunity to be seen and heard by the federal cabinet members who will be attending a liberal convention uh, Liberal Party convention down at the convention center. Uh, uh, Jody Wilson Raybould will, will be speaking. That's the woman who went to the paddle for the peace twice and was. Uh, we have video footage of her in a canoe with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. We will be reminding her and please come and help remind the federal government of their promise. They have to restore the, the honor of this nation. 11.30. And I think I will let Susan talk about legal strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Susan. Okay, I want everybody to take a deep breath. <laughs> and integrate, because you've heard a lot tonight. And it's not light stuff. I think you all probably feel a little bit heavier. <laughs> I know I feel the weight of everything we've heard. I'd like to thank Julian and Ben and Anna and all of you for being here and acknowledge that I'm a guest here on Coast Salish territory. For those of you who don't know, and I know that there are friendly faces out there and I won't point fingers, but uh, RAVEN is an acronym for Respecting Aboriginal Values and Environmental Needs. And we're based here in Victoria, but we are the only nonprofit charitable organization in Canada that raises legal defense funds for First Nations who enforce their rights and title to protect their traditional territories. And as a result, Raven is working to support the West Moberly and Prophet River First Nations in this David versus Goliath legal run up against BC and BC Hydro. And both of which I'd like to point out have unlimited legal funds and a veritable army of lawyers that are working tooth and nail to defeat the First Nations. Because as you've heard, Christy Clark has made this a legacy project and she's not willing to lose. So Treaty 8 First Nations are going up against the province and BC Hydro 
Why? Because they know it's the right thing to do. But they also know that their legal actions can stop the dam. And I'm going to get back to that in a second. And the legal actions can set important legal precedent for other nations that are going to come up against this kind of thing. They know that they have rights that are enshrined in the Canadian Constitution. And they know that those rights can't be eliminated just because you put them underwater. Bill Bennett and Christy Clark want you to think that this is a done deal. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. <laughs> CBC Radio, they're being interviewed everywhere. It's in the paper. This is a done deal. That's not the case. There are a multiplicity of legal actions at play that the Treaty 8 nations have brought forward. And I'm just going to speak to one right now. But these legal actions can stop this dam. There are a number of misconceptions about the environmental approval process. And one is that the federal government can't stop the Site C dam even if it wants to. That is not correct. In order for Site C to proceed, the nature of the project requires the approval of both the federal government under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act and BC under our Environmental Assessment Act, such as it is. Sorry, did I say that? Um, if the project fails to receive approval from either BC or Canada, or, and this is the big capital letter, or, the courts declare that one of the approvals already issued is invalid, then Site C will not proceed. Just register that, because that's important. It also is that any other permits issued from previous authoriza authorizations would be invalid. So in a nutshell, striking, this is, and this is the federal action that Treaty 8 has brought forward, striking down the federal approval of Site C would be enough in and of itself to stop the Site C dam. That is now before the BC uh, approval, or sorry, um, appeals court, and will probably go to the Supreme Court. We're going to get to that in a second, too. So I would like to turn around some of this done deal statement stuff that you keep hearing and point to the lack of respect for the legal process and for First Nations demonstrated by BC, by Christy Clark, our Premier, who recently stated, as Ben noted, that it's her goal to get past the point of no return. But in saying that, that means we're not there yet. We're not past the point of no return. But in her saying that, just that statement in the face of Treaty 8 rights and in the face of our legal system is, to me, personally, offensive. Because basically what she's saying is that she wants to get to the point where enough damage has been done through the construction and the teardown of trees that when the courts come out with rulings as to whether or not this project is unconstitutional, because that's what it's going to come down to. And guess what? When it's unconstitutional, it's done. Because, again, those treaty rights are enshrined in the Constitution. Her position is moot, right? So, so Christy is saying courts, Constitution, First Nations rights be damned. As long as I can destroy that valley quickly enough, it won't matter. And I just can't stand for that personally, and that's not what Raven stands for. That is not justice. Raven is all about access to justice. That's our mandate. That's what we're here for. 
And as I said at the outset, BC and BC Hydro have deep pockets. It's going to cost several hundred thousand dollars to see these multiple legal actions through the courts, most likely to the Supreme Court. And I was asked to point out, I had a little conversation earlier, that um, part of the reason for that is that governments in moving forward ha have adopted tactics of delay and outspend. They bring motion after motion after motion, and they all cost money. And I got a call a while ago from a disgruntled person who heard about our campaigns and said, they challenged the campaign and said, well, why should I have to pay for First Nations to go to court and protect it? And I stopped. And I said, well, you don't have to, actually. It's entirely voluntary. But guess what? You do have to pay, regardless of where you sit on this issue, for BC and Canada to drag their heels through the courts and spend millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars because that's what they're doing. They're spending your money. So I just thought I'd point that out to you. So I'm taking it that you're here because you care. <laughs> Put up your hand if you care. All right, good. That's good. You might have even joined a Facebook page or liked uh, something or joined a newsletter, but I'm now here to ask you to act. I'm asked you, asking you to put that care into action. And you can do that by donating to support the Treaty 8 legal actions. Raven has a campaign called Join the Circle. You can access it online by no, going to the website called nosite-c.com. Or you can donate via check made out to Raven with Treaty 8 in the memo line. All the money goes to their legal action. We've raised several hundred thousand, and I can tell you that right now, up to the point where we hit $250,000, the donations are being matched. We're at about a, we have about $28,000 left in matching funds. If you have already donated, and I know some of you here have, and I won't point fingers again, thank you. I would ask you to lead now. You've, you've taken that action and you've, you've, you've done the action, but now I want you to lead by setting up a fundraising page. And you'll be in good company because people like David Suzuki, Caleb Bain, Lynn Chapman, and Holly Arntzen have already set up pages and, and raised several thousand dollars by getting their friends to donate. And it, that is super easy. You go to the nosite-c.com website, click on become a fundraiser, and it walks you through it. And if, if you feel a little uncomfortable, you can call our office and somebody will talk you through it. But I will say that in this last minute that I have here, it's the one act of reconciliation we can all do. Put our money where our mouth is. Stand shoulder to shoulder with the Treaty 8 First Nations. Join the circle. Stop the damage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. Maybe people want to stand up and stretch for a second. Stand up. So it's going to hand out some action sheets we've got describing some different things that you can do. You've got with the websites and all the kind of details. And Anna, can you put up those slides for me, please? So we wanted to talk just a, a, a brief bit more and then get some questions and answers. And, and I just up on the slide, you'll see some of the key messages tonight, from tonight. And uh, we'll take a look at those. 
One of the things that I wanted to mention though on the, having made this trip up north and about reconciliation, that sort of thing, and hasn't been mentioned tonight so far, has been the work of Amnesty International. One of the, one of the people on the bus with us was the Amnesty International staff person. And um, I kind of wondered, I, when I first met Don Wright, I thought, what, what exactly or what would bring you on this bus and why would you be involved with us? And, and the, the point of the, of the thing was that Amnesty International, you folks know, is all about political prisoners in other countries and the kind of trouble that, um, that we see um, in other places. And I thought, what, why would Amnesty International be involved in Site C exactly? Well, they're involved for two reasons. One is the concern about honoring treaties and the notion of free, prior, and informed consent. This is all happening on First Nations land, and uh, we've, uh, Canada has um, um, joined in with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and one of the key things there is that people in, uh, the Indigenous people have, a, have, a, have land rights and we need to be respecting those. The second issue is the murdered and missing Indigenous women and children. With extractive industries, what we get is um, when you have large camps of men working in transient positions and temporary um, uh, stays, there becomes a big sex industry around that. That happens, uh, you, everybody knows about that in Fort McMurray. Well, it's also going on in Northern British Columbia and Fort St. James and Fort St. John. You have, um, as I say, this transient workforce. The men are generally getting high wages. There's a big gap. Women are lowly paid. This sets things up for risk of violence. And of course, Indigenous women are the people who are most at risk for violence. And um, we've got a lot of trouble. People have heard about the Highway of Tears, and we stopped on the bus there and, and remembered the women who've been killed on the Highway of Tears. But I'm not sure people understand that women are, Indigenous women and children are being killed and uh, disappearing across the province. 14 women have, have gone missing from Fort St. John uh, thus far. So Amnesty International is saying, wait a minute, you're going to build a dam, you're going to bring in more temporary workers, more people from away, camps, I think the camp that's being built now will house 2,000 something, just over 2,000 men. Um, the concern is that by doing that and bringing that in, we should be, if we're going to do this, we ought to be preparing for the social dislocation and damage that we've done, protect the people there. And the difficulty is, when you look at the documents, there's not a word about any of that. So it's an important thing for us to be thinking about when we, when we talk about sightseeing and that sort of thing. Thanks everybody tonight Thank for you. coming. Thank you, for the work. You can donate to Raven on the way out, grab a button if you like, talk to your friends, there's new events coming up, and if you want more action sheets, there's some here. Thanks to the volunteers who helped us tonight, and thanks to Anna and Julian on the sound and on the AV system. And thanks again to our speakers tonight so much.